Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight at Keys to a Healthy Pregnancy. My name is Ellen, and I'm one of the public health nurses in the Nurse Family Partnership Program here at Niagara Region Public Health. My background is um, prenatal, postnatal, pediatric, um, neonatal nursing. I'm also a lactation consultant, so I visit moms out in the community. Um, if there's any sort of infant feeding, um, infant support, prenatal support that you're interested in, we would love to have you join one of our programs. I'm here tonight with Cassie, another one of our lovely nurses, so I'll let her introduce herself. Hi there, Hi. I'm Cassie. I'm a public health the region. Um, I'm in the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program. I initially started nursing on pediatrics, and now I'm with the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. And I primarily see uh, postpartum moms in the hospital and give supports and connect everybody to some resources there. Um, the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program is great uh, if you just have some questions about parenting or uh, nutrition in pregnancy. We do some prenatal visits as well lots of breastfeeding support and uh, helping with growth and development and meeting those milestones uh, postpartum. Awesome. Okay, so just as a bit of a disclaimer, um, the live stream tonight, it's only for educational purposes. So if you have any specific questions regarding your own health, your child's health, please consult your healthcare provider um, for any of those questions that you may have. So prior to jumping into our information tonight, we would like to take this time now to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this webinar, and that being the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the dish with one spoon, wampum, and the two row wampum agreements. These agreements establish relationships between nations for harmonious coexistence based on respect, kindness, and acceptance, and stewardship of the land and resources to ensure that all people benefit and thrive. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Acknowledging this reminds us that our great standard of living in Niagara is directly related to the resources and friendships of the Indigenous people. All right, so just as a quick overview, um, Cassie and I are with you for a short period of time tonight. We've chosen some topics that we think are absolutely applicable to having a healthy pregnancy getting you on the right start with your pregnancy um, and supporting you kind of moving through the different stages that your body's going through. So one of the first things that I would love to comment on is prenatal vitamins. So this is something that we get a lot of questions about here at Niagara Parents um, in our home visiting programs. Why do I need to take a prenatal vitamin? Where do I get them? What services are available? So a prenatal vitamin is really important to ensure you are getting the vitamins and nutrition that you need, as well as ensuring you are getting folic acid. So folic acid during pregnancy is critical as it plays a major role in the development and the closure of the neural tube in your fetus. So prenatal vitamins, they all contain folic acid and it's super, super important. So look for the folic acid on your prenatal vitamin. It's something that's usually well, uh, well noted on the bottle or on the back. Something in our area that we're really quite lucky to have is a program called Baby Be Healthy. So any Sobeys, Freshco grocery stores that have a pharmacy within the, within the grocery store itself, they offer free monthly prenatal vitamins to any pregnant client. So it's a really great alternative to, you know, if spending the money on the vitamins is a deterrent. We want to ensure that everyone has the healthiest pregnancy they can. So if anyone has any questions about how to access those services or looking for, you know, pointing you in the right direction, please reach out to us here at Niagara Parents and we'd be super happy to support. So I think a really great tie-in with our prenatal vitamins is eating a balanced diet. So 
So Cassie has some great information for us on that. Yes, um, I just wanted to add as well, there is another program um, that does provide some nutrition and uh, healthy, uh, healthy food options, food certificates and uh, prenatal vitamins. And that's healthy from the start. Mm. Um, Ellen, do you uh, have a little bit to add about that program? Yeah, I can for sure. So Healthy from the Start is a program. Um, it's run through the Canadian Nutrition Partners. Here in the Niagara region, we have a few different sites that offer the programming. So any pregnant woman, her partner, you're welcome to attend. And they cover a variety of topics. So you may attend a session that talks about labor and delivery, infant feeding, mental health, budgeting, they offer a really wide variety of information that's going to support our families along that journey. Um, any class or session that you do attend, you're compensated with a gift card to a grocery store. You're also eligible for free prenatal vitamins through um, their programming. They have lots of freebies and goodies that they provide and the information that they share is so wonderful. They're really well connected with the community partners here in Niagara. So definitely something that we recommend um, in the community and public health. We also have a really strong partnership with them. So we do a lot of educational presentations to help support, um, again, the families in our community. Awesome. Thanks, Ellen. Mm -hmm. All right. And that brings us to a healthy diet. Uh, so as you know, what you eat, what your nutrition is, does affect baby. Um, the more nutritious food that you're having, the better the health effects of uh, the outcome will be on baby. Uh, so you mainly just want to make sure that you are you are picking a variety of uh, vegetables and fruits, trying to fill that plate up with uh, mostly fruits, vegetables, adding in some lean proteins, some lean, uh, some healthy fats as well. Um, you want to try to avoid uh, too much uh, saturated saturated fats. Um, so you want to have some foods like that have nuts, seeds, vegetable oils. Those are all good options. Anything with the omega-3 uh, fatty acids. Uh, fish is good as well. The only thing um, that you just want to avoid sushi, unfortunately. So no, no raw or undercooked meat. Um, you can have fish with less that has less mercury. Um, so you can have canned tuna. Just try to stay away from that, the fresh tuna, because that has a little bit more mer mercury in it. Uh, you want to make sure that you're fully cooking your meats as well. And uh, throughout the first trimester, uh, you just keep your diet the same. You don't have to add extra food or extra calories throughout the first trimester. In the second trimester and the third trimester, uh, I know a lot of people say that you're eating for two, but you actually don't want to double your calories. Um, you just want to have a couple extra servings about 300, 400 calories extra per day, and just try to make sure that that is some healthy foods. Um, again, lots of veggies and try to stay away from too much salt or sugars. A uh, good option for uh, drinking would be water. That, that would be your best bet, mm -hmm. uh, especially that can help uh, with constipation. Sometimes uh, pregnant moms do tend to become constipated. So adding in extra fiber, which you'll get in those vegetables and lots of water that will help out as well. That's great, Cassie. And it's so important too, when we think about, you know, our plate of food, wanting to access all of those food groups. And a lot of pregnant women, um, they crave some of those, you know, unhealthy fast foods, the easy go-tos. And while those aren't necessarily terrible, we don't want to have those in large quantities. So planning ahead, prepping some food so that you're really eating to nourish your body. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's all about moderation too. So mm -hmm. if you do want that little bit of a treat, that is okay. I <laughs> just try, try to primarily have those healthy foods. And if you are on the go, like Ellen said, plan ahead. Uh, if you know that you're going to be going to appointments or have a lot going on that day, you can uh, cut up some extra veggies, nuts, hummus, um, just some of those easy snacks that are easy uh, to carry with you so that you don't uh, don't stop so much for the fast food on the way home. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard that fast food is everywhere. So just to tie in a bit with um, eating a balanced diet, caffeine is a question we get a lot about. 
So many of us enjoy a coffee or a tea. I'm a tea drinker. Um, and we know that there's quite a bit of caffeine in these beverages. And something as well that we need to be mindful of is the amount of caffeine in other foods. So if you're a chocolate lover, there is caffeine in chocolate. In some of the you know, soft drinks like Mountain Dew that we wouldn't typically consider to be you know, a caffeine rich drink, there's caffeine in that. So a safe guideline is aiming to consume anywhere in the range of 200 to 300 milligrams or less of caffeine a day. So for those of you that, you know, you wake up in the morning, you really need that coffee or tea to wake up and start your day. We're trying to keep our caffeine limit in the range of about one to two cups of coffee or tea a day. And just keep in mind that if you like to have, you know, a pot with lunch or you're a chocolate lover, that there are other sources of caffeine that are kind of trickling into your upper limit in the day. So just being mindful of that, but absolutely you can continue to enjoy your coffee in the morning. And decaf options are great too. There's so many more of those now that are available. So just something else to keep in mind there. So Cassie, I thought another great topic for you to chat about would be moving your body. Yes, so um, moving your body, staying active will definitely uh, benefit you and baby. It's, it's good for your mental health, a nice little outlet. Um, if working out is not exactly your forte, that's okay. Any, any little bit of movement helps. Um, if you normally aren't really that active, you can start, start slow, um, really listen to your body. And I would aim for about three days per week, 15 minutes. You can go for little walks, um, things that you enjoy as well. There's lots of prenatal uh, yoga classes out there. If that's more up your alley as well. Um, if you already are doing, uh, a lot of weight training or you kind of have a, your own workout going on already, you can still continue with that. Um, just again, listen to your body. Try not to lift as heavy, heavy, maybe just do, um, like a bit higher reps instead of really trying to get those, uh, those personal records or anything like that during pregnancy. <laughs> um, talk to your doctor as well. If you have any questions about that, um, rule of thumb is that you want to be able to carry out a conversation while you're working mm -hmm. out. So not too, too intense, but you can, you can keep up with your, your workouts. Um, some other examples like walking your dog, you can, you can still go for a jog if you'd like, if running is what you like, again, just make sure that you're, you're able to kind of carry a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just avoiding high contact sports, anything that, uh, could possibly be a little more, a little more physical, like soccer or horseback riding. I would, I would stay away from those kind of things and do more low impact and moderate intensity. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think it's really important too, to highlight how beneficial it is to move your body during pregnancy, just on, you know, the shifting ligaments and the changes that are happening. It's a great way to prep for labor and some of the changes that are coming um, and help build some of that stamina and strength. Absolutely. Yeah, so definitely will help you with uh, more energy, stress release, um, better posture. Uh, it helps provide more mm -hmm. oxygen to baby when your heart's pumping, that the blood gets pumping and helps uh, oxygenate, oxygenate baby as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it helps with an easier recovery after birth. And you can even start doing Kegel exercises to help out with that as well, which will also uh, help out postpartum. That's great. And for those of you that don't know what a Kegel exercise is, Kegel exercises are really important for the female pelvic floor. So without going into too, too much detail, um, if you think about when you're urinating and you use the muscles of your pelvic floor to stop the stream of urine, that's engaging in a Kegel exercise. So practicing that throughout the day really makes a difference when it comes time for labor and ultimately pushing. So Kegels, as Cassie mentioned, fantastic. That's, that's, that's great. And you know what, Cassie, you answer some of the, uh, the questions I was wondering about too, about moving your body, because we do get a lot of those questions. 
Um, just to kind of change gears, mental health is something that is so critical. Um, and we really, we really want to focus on ensuring that women and their partners and their families know the changes that can happen to a woman's emotional health while she's going through pregnancy and the postpartum period. So hormones, of course, they play a really significant role in some of those mood swings. And we expect to see some highs, some lows, irritability. When we start to become concerned is when a woman is becoming more withdrawn. She's really anxious, worrying about many things. She's not motivated. Act or activities that she used to enjoy, she's really not partaking in. So looking at yourself, how you're feeling, um, it's always a great conversation to have with your physician. And unfortunately, in many cultures, there's still a stigma attached to mental health. So knowing that, especially in the postpartum period, a postpartum mood disorder is the number one complication of pregnancy. So that just highlights how common these concerns are and knowing that there's support available. So here in the Niagara region, we offer a plentiful um, kind of portfolio of mental health supports for our clientele. So both Cassie and I, we work in different home visiting programs. Cassie went into the Healthy Babies program. So the Healthy Babies program, you can come on to program prenatally, postpartum, or any time until your child enters kindergarten. And there's a number of supports that are available, lots of mental health supports. Myself, I work in a program called the Nurse Family Partnership. We're a little bit more unique in that we service, excuse me, we service women um, and young girls under the age of 25 who are having their first baby. And we support them prenatally up until the child turns two. Now, both of these programs have a huge focus on mental health, mental wellness, establishing connections within the community. Um, they're free of charge. Referrals can be made directly through Niagara Parents. So we would welcome the opportunity to support you in that regard. We also have Niagara Parents, as I mentioned, where you can call in and speak with a public health nurse. You can live chat her. Um, you can send us an email and we can offer support that way. We also are running a CBT, so a cognitive behavioral therapy program. There's so many resources available and getting the message out there is our goal. So if you find that you're not feeling yourself, you're struggling, we want you to enjoy your pregnancy. We want you to enjoy your baby. Please reach out so that we can support you. And Cassie, I don't know if you have any other tidbits to add to that. Oh uh, yeah, that was great, Ellen. Um, yeah, so just Ellen, Ellen was talking about how her, the program that she is in, Nurse Family Partnership, is primarily um, moms under 25, and it's their first pregnancy. So I just wanted to note that uh, healthy babies, healthy children, um, like Ellen said, it could be prenatal, postpartum, it doesn't matter if you have one kid, three kids, uh, we still have that support for you. Um, and yeah, just take every each day, day by day, um, try to try to do little things each day that make you mm -hmm. happy. Um, that can help help prevent the postpartum mood disorders as well. And just really talking to your friends, your family, your partner and being open with your emotions and letting them know um, if you do need that support and not being afraid to say no and mm -hmm. taking that time to your for yourself as well. Even if you need to write like a little list down and okay, these are things that I need to finish today. These are things that can maybe wait and maybe just get a couple of those things done and then take that time afterwards and do something that you like, even if it's just sitting outside for five, 10 minutes just to unwind. Um, but it's really important to take that time to yourself as well. And yeah, that's take great. Your body and your mind. That's perfect. So Cassie, I just took a peek there. Um, so we've had some really great questions come in. And one of the first ones I see here is about physical activity. So I'd love to read it out and see what your thoughts are on it. Um, so the question we received is, if you are already doing more moderate to high intensity physical activity and want to continue that during your pregnancy, is there a recommended time or gestational age that you should decrease that activity at? Okay, that's a great question. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, I would, I would obviously talk to your doctor as well, see if there's any medical conditions or anything that's inhibiting, that would inhibit you from doing those activities. Um, but like I said, if you can still carry out those activities, maybe not as high intensity, because uh, mm -hmm. just follow that rule of thumb that you want to be able to carry out a conversation just so that you don't overdo it. And maybe just reduce the, the weights a little bit or yeah, reduce that intensity and really listen to your body. So if you're yeah. feeling, if you're feeling exhausted, then that's enough for a day and just kind of maybe stretch it out and relax a little bit, uh, just not to overdo it, which I know can, can be tricky <laughs> if you're set on a certain schedule, but, um, yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Cassie. I saw another question here and I'll just speak to this since I chatted a bit about, um, prenatal vitamins. So one of our questions was, do prenatal vitamins contain anything other than folic acid that would be important for my pregnancy? So prenatal vitamins, they do offer differing values of different vitamins and minerals um, that would be, you know, potentially a little bit more than what a traditional, you know, women's vitamin may have. Some vitamins, they'll say, you know, extra vitamin D added or omegas added. Really, it's up to you what you feel most comfortable taking. Under Health Canada, all marketed prenatal vitamins have to have the same key ingredients. So it's totally up to you what you feel most comfortable using. Um, and also chat with your physician or your midwife because they can offer some really good insight into brands that they find have been really helpful. Some women find that taking the prenatal vitamins at a certain time of day can bring on some more of that nausea. So taking your vitamin with a meal, sometimes later in the afternoon around dinner time, that can help a little bit with that. So having that conversation with your healthcare provider, they can really help steer you in the right direction based on what your needs are. Mm -hmm. Another thing too would be um, some, some moms might need a little bit more iron as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have to have another iron supplement on top of that or add in lentils, beans, things like that. If you uh, don't eat meat and just to be open that with your open about that with your midwife and doctor as well. Yeah, that's, and that's really important. And something else too, um, that I always share with my own clients is if you are low in iron and you're taking an iron supplement, it's best to take that supplement with a food or a beverage that contains vitamin C that helps with the absorption. So taking it with, you know, a glass of orange juice or having an orange that really helps encourage that absorption of the iron. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, we're getting so many great questions. There's another one here I see. Um, can I travel during pregnancy? So travel during pregnancy, it's variable based on, you know, the woman's situation. So usually airlines, um, some cruise ships, they will have a limit on the gestation that they will accept a pregnant, um, a pregnant attendee or passenger just to be safe. And, you know, if there was anything to happen, you know, 30,000 feet in the air, is there the support that's needed? So I always recommend any time that you're planning travel, whether it's significant, it's two or three hours away, you're approaching your due date, have that conversation with your healthcare provider so that you're prepared should early labor happen, you know what to look for, and you know what services and facilities are available to you within that area. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Cassie, there's another question um, that I think would be great. So let me pull it up here um, about weight gain during pregnancy. Okay. All right. So what's, what's the question, Ellen? Um, so we had a question come in about how much weight is normal to gain during pregnancy. Okay. So, um, there is a uh, healthy weight gain is important. Uh, so that helps having a healthy weight gain helps your baby to grow, uh, helps your uterus and placenta grow and helps you get ready for breastfeeding. And also uh, you need some more of that blood volume to increase as it will mm -hmm. carry nutrients to uh, your growing baby. Yeah. So the amount of weight gain, uh, it's more individualized, but mm -hmm. generally, um, 
it's about 25 to 30 pounds. Uh, that's the majority average amount. Um, the first trimester is only a little bit. So it's about two to four pounds. Um, that being said, if, um, if you are, if you are, uh, if your BMI is a little bit high or you are a little bit underweight or a little bit overweight, you might need to gain a little bit more or less. So that's something that, um, would be good for you to talk to your, uh, practitioner, your midwife or your doctor. Yeah. And just going along with that too, Cassie, I know for a lot of women in that first trimester that experience significant nausea or hyperemetous graffitarium, um, that can really contribute to weight loss in the first trimester because moms aren't able to keep food in, keep food down. So if you're struggling to get your food in because of nausea and vomiting, absolutely speak with your healthcare provider. There are medications that can help you with that. And we want to make sure that you are gaining the weight that, you know, your body needs to nourish that baby that's growing inside of you. We are getting so many questions, Cassie. It's great. Um, one of our next ones here is what should I do if I don't have a family doctor or OBGYN? So um, I can speak to that one really quickly. We here in Niagara, it can be a bit of a challenge right now finding a family doctor, um, a healthcare provider in general. So on our regional website, we do have a link, which I'm sure can be shared with the group following for physicians, um, healthcare teams that are accepting new patients. So that is a really good go-to. If you don't have a family doctor, you're newly pregnant, please attend a walk-in clinic so that you can be sent for the appropriate dating ultrasounds, um, anatomy ultrasounds, blood work that is so important during your pregnancy. There's also the option here in Ontario and within Canada where you can choose to go with either an OBGYN or you can choose to go with a midwife. If you choose to go the route of an OB, you do need a referral from a physician to access those services. If you're interested in midwifery care, you can self-refer to their practice. In Niagara, we have three different midwifery groups just based on our geography. And all three of them, you can refer yourself online. They will get back to you, whether they're full, if they have a space, next steps, that sort of thing. So it's another really great option. But even if you are without a provider, please seek out walk-in clinic support for those initial assessments to help move things along there. And we can help you navigate that as well here at Niagara Parents if anyone is a bit stuck and unsure where to go next. I see we got another question. Okay, is there anything other than uncooked fish that I should avoid? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, Perfect. So yeah, anything raw, um, raw or unpasteurized dairy products. Um, also just certain deli meats, um, deli meats that not that is non-dried uh, just because there's that little bit of a risk of listeria possibly. Mm -hmm. um, you also certain cheeses like soft cheeses or blue cheese and brie. Uh, more of the hard cheeses would be okay. Just there's less of that risk of um, uh, any mold or anything like that for those cheeses. Um, you can still have egg products. Just make sure everything is well cooked. Um, mm -hmm. No, no raw cookie dough batter or anything like that. <laughs> That's yeah. a good point. Cause that could be a craving raw yeah. cookie dough batter. It's good. Oh, I love it. Um, we got another question. Let me pull it up here. Is it safe to have sex during pregnancy? So this is actually something that we are asked quite commonly and isn't something that's talked about kind of in the wide open world. It is okay to have sex during pregnancy. It's important to note though, how you feel and your comfort level. So with the change in hormones, you may experience some vaginal dryness. Some women after having sex or if they've had an orgasm, they may experience some uterine cramping. 
And that is normal because of the increased blood flow because of pregnancy and the sexual activity to the pelvic region. If at any point um, after intercourse, you notice bleeding, extreme cramping that's not improving, please reach out to your healthcare provider. But ultimately it comes down to your comfort level and you know, your relationship with your partner, what's gonna be best. All right, I think that is it for the questions that we've received. We got some really, really good questions tonight. Oh, we got one more. Are cravings okay. different for everyone? I love speaking about cravings. Do you mind, Cassie, if I chat a bit about it? Okay. <laughs> Um, so cravings, they can be very different for every woman. They can be different pregnancy to pregnancy. There's some old wives tales that, you know, if you crave sweet foods, you're going to have a girl, if you're craving salty foods, you're going to have a boy. There's no evidence rooted in that at all. It's just more of a fun guessing game with cravings. If you're somebody that's having kind of more of those funky cravings. So like, you know, you want vanilla ice cream with pickles on top. Great. Um, we just want to make sure that with your cravings, like give yourself that little bit of a treat. But if it is something that's more, you know, high sodium, deep fried, super, super sweet, limit it to more moderation. So if you're looking after or you're looking for those sweet foods, try making, you know, a yogurt parfait. Or if you're after those saltier foods, things like pickles can be a great option or, you know, cooking a chicken breast and seasoning it at home. I know it makes it a little bit less fun, but uh, cravings can be quite interesting and they definitely change over the course of your pregnancy. So something you loved in the first trimester, you could hate by the third, something you hated and could not even stand the sight of in the first trimester, you're loving like four weeks later. So it's really, really individual and have fun with it, I guess. Enjoy those little uh, treats that you get to have. Oh, we got another question. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, Cassie, this question that came in, it's asking a bit about mental health. So will anxiety or depression be heightened during pregnancy? Okay, so that really, uh, that really depends on the individual. Um, some people are more predisposed to um, having anxiety and depression. Um, if you already do have a pre-existing, if you have pre-existing anxiety or depression, um, I would just keep an eye out on that and uh, make sure you are in tune with yourself and just doing those little, uh, those little daily checks, seeing how you're feeling. Um, but it, it is definitely a possibility, it's a possibility, um, just from all the different hormonal changes and preparing for parenthood and things like that. Um, but it's not, it's not a definite thing. It's not automatically your anxiety and depression will just be through the roof. Um, so it is very, very individualized. Um, the most you can, the best, most you can do really is just try to, um, be more preventative about it and see, see a counselor. If you feel anything is going on, you can always reach out to our Niagara parents number as well. Um, yeah, and just uh, trying to stay active and uh, really doing those little self-care things that you enjoy. Yeah, that's, it's yeah. so important for the self-care because so many pregnant women, you know, they're busy and you're balancing work and, you know, time for yourself, time with your partner, if you have other kids. Um, and like Cassie did say, having a history of a mental health concern does place you at an elevated risk for developing a prenatal or a postnatal um, mood disorder. But I always share with clients that it's a benefit in a sense to know that because it gives you that opportunity to really hone in on how you're feeling. And if you're noticing any of those blips, sometimes you may not necessarily notice it in yourself, but a partner or a family member, a good friend, they start to say, Hey, you're not really, you know, you're not, presenting the way you normally do. You're not laughing anymore at my jokes. So that's something that can help too. The other thing that's important to note as well is a postpartum mood disorder can present at any point within baby's first year. So you could have a wonderful, um, you know, 11 months mood wise and at 11 and a half months, 
we're coming up to a transition, you're starting to notice some of those anxiety or depressive symptoms. And that falls within the category of a prenatal or sorry, a postnatal mood disorder. So reaching out, we have a lot of supports. We have great sources for referrals to different clinics, different physicians, different supports. So please speak up because we want you to enjoy this time and we want you to feel as good as you possibly can. Please don't suffer in silence. Support is always, always available. Um, let's take a peek here. Okay. So I think that is it for our questions tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for attending on this uh, Thursday evening. It was great to chat about healthy pregnancy. And if any of those questions do pop up, you know, you go sit down and you have a quick tea and you think of something that you forgot to ask or you're wondering about, Niagara Parents will be there tomorrow morning at 8.30. And we are super happy to, uh, to direct you in whatever direction is needed. So thank you so much again for attending and uh, we hope to support you soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.